Thank you, Erin. That was beautiful. Wow. Good morning. Happy Labor Day. So uh, Labor Day is uh, known as the end of the summer. It is the time of year that uh, we have picnics and we sort of recognize that, okay, summer's over, now it's time to get back to work and get back to school and get serious about life. And also, I guess I heard that you're never supposed to wear white after Labor Day. Remember that? <laughs> white shoes, white, you know. Got to get those dark clothes back out. The truth is that Labor Day began in 1894, was when it first became a federal holiday, and it was in response to the Pullman strike where the U.S. military and U.S. marshals um, killed some workmen. And so President Grover Cleveland, in seeking reconciliation with the labor movement, made it a top political priority and made it a holiday. And so on this weekend, we are honoring labor and we are honoring rest and leisure. So I wanted to focus on the idea today of what does it mean to work? Now, we have work, work, and we have job, jobs, and we have careers, and we're retired and unemployed. So what I want you to hear as I'm speaking about work is about service, is about giving. And we serve in so many different ways. We serve our families, uh, our children. We serve our, our homes. Our, our, we volunteer. So there's lots of different ways that we uh, work. So... Um, and if you think about it, I'm sure that many of us and many have, have had varied jobs over your life, yeah? Have you had many, many different jobs? I was looking back at my own life and my different jobs, and I used to actually work in a disco back in the 70s. In fact, I worked at two discos, not just one. I had a regular job uh, working at a law firm during the, during the week, and then in the evening, one, one evening a week, actually, I would, uh, and it was like going to a party, so I felt like I was being paid to be the hostess at a party. It was kind of fun. My daughter uh, just started her first job this summer, and my daughter is an athlete, so she's been unable to get a job job, you know, because she's got sports every single day, including college, so she's 20 years old, and so finally, she's like, I can get a job. So uh, this summer, she got a job at the Coeur d'Alene Resort as the pool girl, indoor pool. And she was so excited to be able to show up for work, and she couldn't wait. And so she, I said, well, call me when you get home, because I want to hear all about it. So she called me, and I said, so how was your first day? And she goes, Mom, the clock never moved. <laughs> She said, every time I looked at the clock, it was still on this, it was still two o'clock. And I was stuck there. I couldn't go anywhere. I had to stay there and I had to fold towels and I had to be, stand behind this counter and, and, and talk to people and the clock. And I got to go and do it again tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, Caroline, I think that's why they call it work. A few years before my parents died, I interviewed them on video and asked them all kinds of questions. And one of the questions that I asked them was, well, what, what were some of the jobs that you've had in your life? And it was an interesting door that opened to knowing them better, you know, finding out that my dad was a cab driver and a truck driver and a pin boy at a bowling alley when he was a kid. And my mom worked at all these other weird places, including building coffins. And she'd say, you know, it looks really cushy in there, but it actually isn't. It's just wood with, you know, cloth around it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think one of my uh, more interesting jobs when I was a minister in Reno, Nevada, part of the deal in being a minister in Nevada is that you do weddings, especially since we were so close to California. And at that time, in the 80s, there was a six-week waiting period to get a, a marriage license. And uh, they used to require a blood test. So people, rather than deal with that, would come over the mountain and they would get married in Reno where you could go pick up your marriage license and get married on the same day. And the courthouse used to be open 24 hours a day. Now they close at midnight, so they're a little more strict. Um, <laughs> so I used to do most of the big weddings, you know, the, the, the large weddings, and I'd have one or two a weekend usually, but once in a while I would fill in at the wedding chapel. And they wanted uh, new thought ministers to work at the wedding chapel because they knew that we wouldn't try to save anybody's soul while we were marrying them. <laughs> so they called Unity. 
And so I would fill in. <laughs> so I would fill in once in a while, and one day I had 12 weddings in a row. And they were every 30 minutes, every half hour. And it's not like you sat around and talked. You do the wedding, you're done, you get back in, you do another one. And I remember one time when I walked down the aisle, everybody thought I was the Kino girl ready to take their bets for the day. Um, and there were moments, especially when I was doing like the seventh in a row, that, you know, your mind starts to get a little jelly-like. And I remember doing the wedding and then thinking, I wonder if I'm speaking English, you know? I wonder if they're actually, if the words that I'm speaking are actually coming out right, because at this point it started to feel like word salad. Or I'd come to and I'd think, have we done the vows yet? They don't have wedding rings on yet, so I guess not. I guess we're still there. And then one time I had a couple, I think they were from Germany, and they have a different spatial experience than we do. And so as I'm uh, doing the ceremony, I thought they were too far away. So I took a step closer, and then they took a step back, and then I took a step closer until they were hanging off the edge, and I finally got it that that was one of those things. So... So we have all kinds of jobs that we do that, and all kinds of service that we perform, all kinds of volunteerism. We have careers, we have jobs, we, have, we're, we take care of our homes. We, we show up in service in many ways. And I love Khalil Gibran's poem on work. And so I kind of want to sum up his poem and use it sort of as a base for us to look at labor and to look at work. And in the bulletin, there are pieces of the poem. It's actually longer than that. But what he says is, is you work that you may keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. For to be idle is to become a stranger unto the seasons and to step out of life's procession. So he's telling us that one of the ways that we hook into the mystery of life is through work. That as we love and serve through our work, we are connecting, we are connecting to God and we're connecting to spirit and we're connecting to one another. He said, I say to you that when you work, you fulfill a part of earth's furthest dream assigned to you when that dream was born. So as we show up and we give and we do and we, we love, we are infusing the world with, with purpose. He said, when we love labor, we become intimate with life's most inmost secrets. He also says that all knowledge is vain, save when there is work. So it doesn't do us any good to know everything, yeah? You can know so many things, but when, when without work, it's vain because we're not putting it out in actions and we're not putting it out into the world. And he says, when you work with love, you bind yourself to yourself and to one another and to God. And what is it to work with love? He says, to work with love means that when you build a house, you build the house as if the person that you love the most in the world is going to live in that house. When you cook a meal, you cook that meal as if the person that you love the most in all the world is going to eat that food. When you uh, make clothes or you fix a computer or you make a copy or whatever you're doing, you're teaching, whatever your work may be, when you do it with love and you do it as if you're doing it for the person that you love the most in the world, he says that's what it means to work with love. He said, the wind doesn't blow the top of the tree more sweetly than it does the grass down at the bottom of the floor, ground. It's, it's, it's all one. And he says, you know, you would, might say that someone who's a sculptor has a really important job, but somebody who makes sandals, not so much. Or maybe someone who can create incredible works of art, art is amazing, but then someone who plows a field and is a farmer, not so much. He said it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we call the job. It doesn't matter what we call the work, but that it's all needed. It's all necessary. Paul said it when he said uh, that we're the body of Christ, that he said that... Um, the foot isn't better than an eye and the elbow's not better than an ear, you wouldn't say to your body that one part is more important than the other. You need the whole. And so it is as we work, as we serve, as we, we serve in labor with love, that we are all connected in that way. He says, if you cannot work with love, 
he says that it's better to go sit outside of a temple and take alms and just beg for your money. He said if you're going to make bread and you're going to do it indifferently, it only feeds half of a person's hunger because they're still hungry for that love. Or if you're going to, to uh, make wine and, and, and you're resentful of what you're doing, that poison goes into the grapes. It makes me think of that movie and that book that was out about 15 years ago, like Water for Chocolate. Remember that? Where she'd be cooking and she'd be sad and crying in, her, in whatever she was cooking and then when the people ate it, they would cry and they couldn't stop. Or she'd cook something and she'd be laughing and then they would eat it and they all couldn't, la they couldn't stop laughing. Or she would, whatever she was feeling and experiencing, she put it into her food. If she was feeling passionate and sexy, then everybody at the table all of a sudden started feeling passionate and sexy. And it's an amazing story and it takes it to the outer limits and the extreme, but it's true. It's it's how we, it doesn't matter what our job description is, or even if we have a job, if we're retired or we're unemployed or we're volunteering, it's how we bring ourselves fully into that experience. Because as we do it again, we keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. In Hinduism, they would call this karma yoga. And what karma yoga is, is um, action. Only it's taking every action and giving it to God so that it becomes an act of worship. So it doesn't matter if you're sweeping a floor or painting a fence or you're writing a book. It's, it's about uh, dedicating each moment to God regardless of what you're doing. And when I lived at the yoga ashram, we had one hour a day that was karma yoga, noon to one. Everybody was required to go find something to do, to get a hammer, to get a paintbrush, to get a broom, to fold laundry, to do whatever, and, and to consciously do that act for an hour uh, to God. And it was very powerful when you have a whole community of like 100 or 200 people that are doing the same thing at the same time. And in my Western mind, it took me a moment to get used to it because you know, I felt like, hey, I'm paying to be here, and now you want me to work? I mean, come on, you know, it's a little bit of a scam. But then I figured out that, no, this isn't a scam at all. This is about learning to be in service, and it is learning to uh, give of karma yoga, to give every act to God and in worship regardless of what you're doing. So I want to share with you a little story um, from the Mah Mahabharata, which is an ancient Vedantic teaching. And there's a story about a young man who is a yogi and a sadhana, a, a sannyasin. He's uh, very serious about his spiritual practice and he does, does his meditation and his yoga postures and he's really good. So he's sitting under a tree and he's meditating and all of a sudden some dry leaves fall on his head and he looks up and there's a crane and there's a crow and they're fighting. And he says, hey, cut it out. He's mad. He goes, cut it out. And as soon as he says that, fire pops out of the top of his head, and it singes the birds until they're nothing but ash that falls to the earth. And he's thinking, hey, I'm pretty powerful. You know, I'm really doing my spiritual practice here, and wow, look what I did. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So he goes into town because, you know, part of being a sannyasin is you, you're begging for your food. And he goes to this woman's house, and he knocks on her door, and he says, Mother, give me food. And she says, you wait a minute. Just wait a minute, son. And uh, he's standing out there, and he's thinking, listen, you. You have no idea who you're messing with. I am so powerful that I could just, you know, with my mind. And uh, she, he's thinking this, and he hears a voice from inside the house, and she says, hey, don't be thinking so much of yourself because there's no crow or crane in this house. And he's thought, how in the world did she know what I was thinking? So when she comes out, he falls at her feet, and he said, how did, you, how did you know what happened in the forest, and how did you know what I was thinking? And she says, you know, I don't know your yoga, and I don't know your practices, because I'm just a common, everyday woman, and I made you wait, because my husband's ill, and I'm taking care of him, and I was nursing him, and all my life, I have struggled to do my duty. When I was unmarried, I did my duty to my parents, and now that I'm married, I do my duty to my husband. That is my yoga practice. 
but by doing my duty, I have become illumined. Thus, I could read your thoughts, and I know what happened in the forest. So it is through the, 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 the karma yoga is, is taking care of your parents or taking care of your partner. Uh, you know, is that a big job description necessarily? Does it look good on a resume? It's not what it's about. It's about giving fully and worshiping and loving in that moment. So she said, I'll tell you, if you really want to meet somebody who's illumined, go into town. And she gave him the name and an address of a man to go and visit. So he said, yes, I would love to meet a, ver a spiritual master. So he, he goes into town, and he meets this man, and he's thinking there must be some kind of a mistake. So this is an, in this is an India, you know, vegetarian land. So this man is huge. He's really fat, and he's a butcher, and he's chopping up, the, he's chopping up meat. And he's like, wait a minute, how can this be? And he says, well, I, I was sent here to talk to you. So he goes home with the man. The man says, let me take care of my parents first. And there's a theme about taking care of parents through all this Mahabharata, I see. But he says, wait here, and I will come talk to you. And then he begins to expound the mysteries of the universe to this young man. And he's amazed. And he says, can I ask you a question? He says, why are you in that body? And with such knowledge as yours, why are you doing such filthy, ugly work? And the teacher said, my son, no duty is ugly. No duty is impure. My birth placed me in these circumstances and environments. So it gets back to what Khalil Gibran is saying, that, you know, so you can sculpt, you know, and you can make these amazing marble statues. Does that mean that you're better than somebody who makes sandals? It's giving over to the process. It's giving over to wherever we are and to whatever we are doing, regardless of what the title of it may be. We have spiritual economics coming up this week. And as I was reviewing spiritual economics again, what I noticed was the whole book is really the same as Khalil Gibran's poem. It is the same as uh, the, the Hindu teachings and karma yoga. Uh, Eric Butterworth said, let your work, whatever it may involve, be an outworking of creative flow. And it is through work, he says, it is through service, it is through giving, it is through karma yoga that we build a consciousness of giving. He said that Jesus said it this way when he said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, the left hand is taking the paycheck and the right hand is doing the work. But if we're constantly looking at the left hand and going, okay, so what's the pay? I'm not sure I'm going to give you so much of the right hand to just not know what either one are doing and to give of yourself fully and completely in the process, knowing from spiritual economics that the creative flow begins to move. I think this is an extremely important lesson, especially in this economy that we have today. Emerson said it this way. He said, let your work be in your bones. Let it be in your bones. So the secret of life is really to enjoy the work that we do and that we come to do every day. You know, the truth is we don't know how long any of us have. We don't know if we've got 10 minutes or you've got 10 years or 20 or 30. <clears throat> Last week I was, doing a, I was doing a wedding. And after the wedding, I don't normally stay at the receptions, but I stayed for a little bit. And I came and I sat down at a table and these two young men in their 30s came and said, are, are these two seats open? And I said, yes, they are. And so they came and sat down and I said, you know, the food is ready, the buffet's ready, you should go get some food. And they said, well, I'm not sure how we're going to save our seats. And so I said, let's put napkins over your chairs and then that way it's saved. And they went through the buffet line and came back and they said, we really like the ceremony. And, you know, it was just how do you do very quick. And then I left. I said, you know, it was nice to meet you, and, and I left. We didn't even really share a meal together. And then on Friday, I got an email from one of the young men. Uh, his name is James, and he said, 
I met you last week at the wedding, and I was wondering if you were available to do a funeral next week. He said the man that I was with, my partner James, was killed in a motorcycle accident on Thursday, and we're planning his funeral for next week. And I thought it was very difficult to get my head around meeting somebody just kind of on the way and then saying hello and then there's the funeral. And the truth is, none of us know how long we have. I mean, this young man was, was strong and handsome and vital and his whole life in front of him. And then, boom, gone, just finished. So part of life and the mystery of life is to, to be able to give is to be able to serve, is to be able to work in whatever form that takes. And we're given this incredible opportunity to, to do that. So in closing, I just have one short story I want to tell you, and it's about the Brennan sent it to me. It's about three men who were uh, wise men who were sitting outside a woman's house when she came home from work one day. And she said, you guys look hungry. You want to come in and eat? And he said, well, they said, let's wait till your husband comes home. So the husband came home, and he said, sure, invite him in. So she went out and she said, come on in, have dinner. And they said, well, only one of us can come in, and you have to decide which one. And he said, I'm love, this is wealth, and he, his name is success. You can only invite one of us in, so go talk to your husband. She went back in the house, and they discussed it, and they said, hey, you know, wealth, that would be pretty good to have in the house. We'd never have any worries. He said, I don't know, success sounds pretty good to me. And the daughter-in-law was listening, and she goes, why don't we invite love in? I mean, ma, then the house would be filled with love. So she went outside, and she approached love, and she said, uh, we'd like you to come in and have dinner with us. And so he stood up, and the other two men stood up and followed him. And she said, I thought you said that I could only invite one of you in. And he said, yes. If you had invited wealth in, wealth would have come by himself. If you'd invited success, success would have come by himself. But because you invited love, wealth and success will follow. So the secret of life is to enjoy work and service. Whether you are retired, unemployed, or employed, whether you have a big job or a job job, no work is higher or better. It's all karma yoga. It's all an act of worship. When you work, when you serve, imagine that you're doing it for your beloved, that you're doing it for the person that you love the most in all this world. Because work calls for you to love life and to keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. Work is love made visible. Amen.